Hello, good evening. Um, up next, we have a presentation by Dr. Madawa Glover. I will introduce her and bring her into the room. Welcome, Madawa. Hi, how, how's it all going? It's going. Um, I'm really glad you're here. Um, now, I just need to clarify with you. Do you want to make your presentation and I'll hang in the background for you and then we'll just come back for question and answer? Yes, please. Okay, um, have you got your presentation queued up? I hope so. Okay, I don't see it. So what you got to do, go oh, down to okay. share. Share, yeah. Okay, share, and you're going to share, share screen. Mm. And window. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, and then click it, and it should come up. Okay. And there we go. And was I going to... You are going to go up to, if you can see it on your screen, set it to present. There you go. So but what I'll I do. Now I can't see you guys. That's okay. What we can do is we can do the presentation. I'll lay back. And then when you're done with the presentation, we can do the question and answer if you want. No, I'd prefer to interact with people as I go. I don't know that there's an, like an hour there. Oh, okay. So we got to make the screen a little bigger then so people can see it because I'm pretty sure that that's going to be real hard for people to see. Um, like we did the last time. Yeah. I, I know. Glasses. I feel you. Okay. Is that better? I'm asking to see. I don't know if they can see it better or not. Okay, Chaga said she can see it, so we're good. So I'm just going to mute and you go do your thing. Okay, and I'm on. Am I? <laughs> Hi, everybody. I presume that I am live. Nancy, you're going to give me a thumbs up there. Right. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> I needed some kind of counting. <laughs> All right, well, I hope that uh, the session, the whole day has been going really fabulous and everyone's learning a lot and discussing the issues we're facing. So what I wanted to share with you all tonight was the perspective for Indigenous peoples. And earlier on this year, I published a large report, um, big, thick <laughs> report on smoking prevalence among all Indigenous peoples in the world. But anyway, first, uh, and I'm going to talk about the relationship of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and how the framework uh, FCTC is ignoring the rights of Indigenous people. So I just want to go through that. Now, the way that I would like to do it is if you have any questions or comments, then, you know, throw them up as we're going along. I'll try to keep up with, with what's there and Nancy can pop in and and let me know if there's anything that I'm missing. So first off, who am I? And sorry. Okay. Thank you. Found my little down button. So I'm Professor Marewa Glover. I began working in community health in Victoria, Australia, actually, in about 1988, and then ended up coming home and began working in public health and on tobacco control work in 1993. 
So if you didn't know, New Zealand was the first country to pass a comprehensive smoke-free environments law. And that was in 1990. The Public Health Commission was set up very soon after that as a separate kind of government agency, but with a commission of independent experts reporting to actually directly to the Prime Minister at that time. So I was just a junior policy analyst and was put to work on a number of issues. Tobacco control was one of them. Uh, I am Indigenous myself and so it was, it was just wonderful to be able to get to work for our people on trying to improve public health. And tobacco, of course, reducing the harms of smoking, that's one of the biggest killers. Um, at that time, we used to say 450 Māori a year were killed by smoking tobacco, diseases and uh, exposure to cigarette smoke. So. In 1999, so this is prior to the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, in 1999 I was very lucky to attend uh, on behalf of the New Zealand Ministry of Health uh, a World Health Organization Framework Convention Tobacco, Contro Tobacco Working Group. Now these were working groups that were set up prior to the actual uh, establishment of the SCTC in terms of it being ready for any nations to sign it. That working group that I went to was consulting really on how the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control could uh, reduce the harms of tobacco for women and for youth. And that was in Japan. There were over 500 delegates there from over 50 plus states. So it was really quite an amazing uh, conference as such. We, we worked on your know, sections basically of a draft framework and would work in small groups and then put forward, you know, the hours that were spent sort of not arguing, but discussing words, which word should be used. And of course, there were many, many women uh, from marginalized groups, from uh, low income countries, uh, and it was wonderful to meet them. And, and I obviously put forward that we need to be thinking about indigenous people as well. But at that stage, there was the word indigenous never made it through into any final wording. At other conferences I went to, world conferences on tobacco or health, in the pre-FCTC days, there usually were sessions, again, consulting, giving people a chance to, to put their sort of point of view forward in terms of the wording and what the FCTC should do and what we're going to make sure that it does. So again, uh, I remember going to one of those meetings and putting my hand up and saying, you know, indigenous people. But again, the word indigenous did not make it into any either summary of these consultations and therefore proposal or recommendations to the secretariat. Um, it wasn't until much, much later that the word indigenous got a mention, but otherwise it just got subsumed under the term minority group. So that's a bit of my background, uh, quite a long history in tobacco control, almost con consistently full-time, um, mostly full-time since 1993. And at this point, I want to go over my disclosures and I have never received funding from any tobacco or vaping product company. Many, many years ago, over 10 years ago, I did receive some fees for consulting with GlaxoSmithKline and um, I can't remember the other company here around cessation medicines when they were first bringing them into New Zealand and how how could they make sure that the products were accessible for Māori? That's a long time ago. Um, 
My centre, however, now is funded by a grant from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. I have a centre grant and the study I'm going to be presenting on tonight was funded with, it, with my grant uh, from the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. And they are a US non-profit uh, 501c3, a private foundation set up in the US and uh, and they do accept charitable gifts. Uh, they were established with a donation from Philip Morris International, but under the bylaws of that state and the pledge document with Philip Morris International, the foundation is independent uh, from Philip Morris and the tobacco industry as a whole. Under the terms of my grant agreement with the foundation, the work I do is editorially independent of the foundation. That is, the work I do is not commissioned by them. It was researcher initiated ideas. I, as I always have uh, in the past, cook up a research project idea and then I put into contested funds for the money. And in this case, I won funding for those ideas. They are mine and my team. So the contents, um, selection and presentation of facts, as well as any opinions that I express in this presentation and discussion, they're so my sole responsibility and under no circumstances should they be regarded as reflecting the positions of the Foundation for a Smoke-Free World. So I hope that that is um, clear. Now, going on with the study that, that we did, now this is a very old picture of the banner up there, the World Health Organization Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And I know that you have been seeing other presentations and you may have gathered by now that the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control is not actually a World Health Organization treaty as such. It's a United Nations treaty and the word convention, if we just break down those words, convention is a treaty. It's a binding international agreement, although um, there, are, there are some things in it that are binding in a general way. Uh, that, that's why the framework part of the title, there are broad areas of action and countries that become signatories are committing to those broad areas of action. It's not like the detail. There was enough room for countries to tailor those broad sets of actions, which might be you must legislate, bring in law around smoke-free environments to protect people from the exposure to secondhand smoke. You know, look, bring in uh, regulations and laws around taxing. So there's a broad area. And then countries had enough freedom to apply that uh, tailored to their own local circumstances and abilities. So, um, and the protocols, there's different parts of the framework, um, the actual treaty itself, there are protocols and there are articles. And over the week, I'm sure that you will, you will get to hear about the different articles, some of them, uh, particularly relate to consumers of products and some relate to, um, I'll be talking tomorrow about Article 5.3, uh, which, which I'll talk about tomorrow. So the, this is generally what the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and you see you can be forgiven for thinking that it is a World Health Organization treaty because there's the World Health Organization logo on that report there and the uh, Framework Secretariat sits within the World Health Organization uh, buildings in Geneva and has. So, you know, it's it's very it's very easy to think, oh, this is a World Health Organization treaty. And in actual fact it's the United Nations Treaty, which is much bigger in a way. Now this is um, in Article three, the part of the purpose of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control was to protect present and future generations from the devastating health, social, environmental, 
and economic consequences of tobacco consumption and exposure to tobacco smoke. And there's more, but then it goes on to reduce continually and substantially the prevalence of tobacco use and exposure to tobacco smoke. I mean, in the earlier, like, you know, it, it was um, all signed off and passed in 2003. So almost uh, 20 years ago. And in the first couple of decades, we were pretty much focused on tobacco smoke. And at conferences, say in India, then obviously there was a lot more focus on harmful use of chewing tobacco. Um, but you see nowadays uh, in this current, let's say, decade, there's, there's a shift of emphasis from tobacco smoke to tobacco use. Um, and yeah, we, yeah, as I said, most of the harm, it was completely recognized that most of the harm, we're talking like over 90% of the actual harm to health that occurs in relationship to smoking, to tobacco, was from smoking. And what they're now trying to do is completely shift that to the use of tobacco in any form and for any use. You see that? Devastating health, social, environmental, and economic consequences. So in the last, I, I think particularly in the last decade, there's been a lot more papers about uh, tobacco smoking, driving poverty. So that would be an economic consequence, of course, in agriculture and in low income, low and middle income countries where tobacco growing is very big. There's a whole lot of consequences of uh, the manufacture and use and consumption and exposure to of tobacco use. I guess the distinguishing thing here is still where it says devastating. Uh, and of course, in terms of tobacco harm reduction, and things have changed an awful lot in terms of the new low risk products that are now available. Where is the devastation? Where is the devastating health, social, environmental, and economic consequences of people using these low risk products? So, uh, moving on to talk about my study. And this really came, it was part of what I wanted to do with the center focus on indigenous people worldwide. And the first thing you're going to do, right, is, well, who are they? Where are they? How much do they smoke? And that's what we began to look at. But it was a pretty big job, so it took us a while. There are about 6% of, of the world's population are indigenous. That's about 476 million people. So it's it's not a small thing. I mean, just in New Zealand, um, Māori are around we a country of 5 million, and there are about 750,000 Māori. We make up about 15% um, of the population. So that's actually quite large. Whereas Australia, the Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander population make up about 2% of the total population. And that all goes to how hard it is uh, to fight the invisibility of Indigenous people. So there's about 6% of the world uh, of, of population are Indigenous, about seven, 476 million people, and disproportionately overrepresented among lower income and marginalised groups. Not everywhere, but uh, it's a common thread. So I just want to talk to you now about the findings in, in my report. Um, just to define Indigenous people, what do we mean by Indigenous people? We're referring to tribes 
or ethnic groups who were living and holding sovereignty in a particular geographical area prior to another group moving in and gaining dominance politically and taking over the governance of that region or country. I can't tell you this, I mean, obviously it was going to be of interest to me, but I really think uh, and encourage you to have a look at my report because apart from it's being quite easy to read, um, it was fascinating. There are just so many countries where colonization has occurred. And in New Zealand, we just tend to talk about Māori being colonized in Australia and and the First Nations peoples in Canada and the and the Native American people. Um, you know, so there's kind of like this group of five countries that talk about being colonized in a very similar way. But in my report, I give each for each country there's a two-page spread with details about uh, where in the world the country is, the location, how large a, a geographical area the country takes up, um, generally what the climate is and the population, who the indigenous peoples are. But then there's a little paragraph which is about this, you know, were they colonized, like who was there first and then who moved in and who took over control, what kind of government exists and the political system. I think that's important for determining um, how policies, whoops, how policies get made. There you go. I've, got, I've found another way to change the slides by touching the mouse. <laughs> um, and, and then I tried to put the smoking prevalence uh, and also whether or not the country has ratified the framework or is a signatory or ratified the framework convention on tobacco control, which is why this study is important to uh, the topic of your, of the, your scope. Uh, over these next few days. The, where do you stop? You know, this is a question that's been raised for me. Where, how far back did we go? So we went back, I guess, as far as around the time of the Ottoman Empire. So around 1500 and came forward from there. And studying the whole world like that, I got a very good picture for how boundaries expand and contract. So the Ottoman Empire grew and grew and took over more and more land and surrounding areas. And then, um, and then you know, people revolt against that, fight back, regain their land, etc., and it contracts. So in recent times, we obviously have seen this with the Russian Federation. So they were growing and taking over more and more areas and then contracting. Right now we see, um, I guess, China is in that expansion mode uh, and you, you just get a feel, well, I hope you do, from the report if you read through and you read that little paragraph about who came in and, and when they came in and took over. Was it, There's different forms of colonization as well. So sometimes they didn't just, like, you know, completely take over. In New Zealand, we had a treaty, not that that stood for very much <laughs> at the beginning and over the years, but um, it gives us some base to fight back now. So constantly boundaries are changing as well. Um, it, it, yeah, and like in the entire African continent. And so you can't just show a map. So um, here's a map, a global map from National Geographic. You, there are, you can't really apply current uh, country borders because over history, those change due to war um, and merging and you know, especially with war where the winning countries then divide up the spoils and you know, give some to, well, you can have that bit and we'll have that bit. So it's just fascinating many, many indigenous peoples and right across the world. Um, and I, I do kind of feel that it is a struggle to capture any kind of interest in this. Um, 
I suppose because in many countries the Indigenous people are a, a small minority group and I think that there's just a constant sort of fighting of of invisible but just we're just rendered invisible constantly so I see there's um thanks Paul and Hinaj now so obviously indigenous peoples around the world have organized and have fought for hundreds of years and and it's just an ongoing and you'll see that in that section and for each country and I, please even just look at the country you're in and what's in my report um so they fight back and we have our own treaty the united nations declaration on the rights of indigenous people uh just going to refer to it as under from from here on now that um, it was very hard to find a definite or agreed upon number of for how many indigenous peoples there are in the world and there are different definitions um, when we searched oh I'll just tell you about the um, under first so that's all about this this is quite a, a, a little booklet here um, again setting out all of the articles it's, it's similar you know it's a it's a United Nations Treaty so it has a general um, principles I guess and similar to the framework convention and then there are articles at, of how the different uh, principles are to be enacted upon so generally and briefly indigenous people have the right to maintain their traditional ways of life just as you have the right to maintain your way of life or your cultural way of life and you have the right to develop your culture and enjoy your particular waltzing matilda or, or type of dance scottish highland dancing whatever it might be and so do indigenous people they also have the right to improve uh, on their economic and social conditions just as you do including improving their health and the states that have taken over uh, and have hold political dominance in the countries where these indigenous people resided and still do reside um, not in all cases uh, the, the states have a responsibility to assist indigenous people in that development and in in pursuing their desires now information and sovereignty over that information data is an essential need uh, and that's recognized within the framework convention on tobacco control in fact it's a it's part of that empower the Bloomberg framework of how to implement the FCTC monitoring uh, collecting data reporting every country has to put in a report these are all online and you can that's where I got a lot of the information that's in the report you go to the framework convention World Health their website and you can look up the actual report that all the countries put in which is very interesting it's a bit of a tick box um, but they're supposed to say the prevalence and how many they even now say how many people use smokeless they may now be asking about uh, other harm reduction products so that's one place to look for the data that you might be interested in as well now so we looked for where all the people were um, what countries who they are um, there there are just thousands and thousands of tribes so that that became a very huge job I think in um, in Australia there are over 500 and uh, you know in um, First Nations there's over 600 tribes I didn't really think about that when I started out because in in terms of Māori I mean we are a tribal people and 
you know, my tribe is, say, Ngāpuhi, from up north of New Zealand, but we tend to be referred to collectively as Māori. Um, so there are many, many tribes. I kind of went, well, I'm happy to find any data on smoking prevalence for Māori or for Australian Aboriginal people collectively or First Nations people in Canada. Um, so that was the first step to look for smoking prevalence data. Um, there wasn't much. <laughs> and I, I've just recently submitted a paper to a journal, which is quite interesting. And they said, oh, I thought that this was going to be telling me about what's the smoking prevalence of indigenous people in the world. That's kind of would be interesting. Oh, and it didn't. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, that's what the paper's about. Where is the data? And then the reviewer said, because there was no data, then it wasn't worth publishing. And this is this invisibility that um, you know, I've constantly had to fight against. Uh, so I couldn't get the paper published because I didn't have the data. How am I ever going to get the data if I can't publish about this issue? This is an example of what's in the report. So I hope you can see that even though it's a big report, it's actually not that hard to read. This is Costa Rica. It shows you where in the world on the globe Costa Rica is. So a little visual, the location in text terms, the size of the country in square kilometers, the climate. And why is the climate interesting? To me, you know, the climate does have an impact on what tobacco or nicotine products might be used, may have been able to be accessed or what was used there by Indigenous people prior to, you know, the commercialization and mass manufacturing of tobacco and nicotine products. Um, for instance, way up in uh, the top of Norway, uh, Sweden, Finland and into Russia where the Sami people are, well, they've used Swedish snus or snus type products for hundreds of years. And, um, you know, when you have like minus 50 degrees outside, it's pretty hard to go outside and have a cigarette. Not that everyone went outside and they had pipes in those days, but it was just easier to keep the snus, for instance, is moist. So imagine trying to keep dried tobacco for smoking dry in that kind of environment. So actually climate is kind of important. And in very, very hot areas, you may find that the smoking pattern or the pattern of use is quite different than in temperate zones or cold zones. So I was interested in that. Um, the size of the population, who the indigenous tribes are or peoples, they all have different terms. And then about Costa Rica and the colonization of Costa Rica. And I bold what country colonized uh, each of the countries we look at. Now, this is very interesting. Even if you got the report and you flicked through it, like one of those movies we used to make, you know, <laughs> out of paper, you flick through and you watch those bold terms of countries that colonized. Very, very interesting coming from New Zealand and down under where we were colonized by the British. I don't think a lot of people think of, say, Italy or Germany or the Dutch as well, maybe, yes, the Dutch, but um, those European countries, it, it was like all on, they, they were all into it, right? And I think a lot of that is forgotten. Um, which countries took over. And this also impacted on the spread of tobacco or what I call the dispersion of tobacco around the world. Now, um, I also put the economic status, as you know, that's that, you know, tobacco consumption around the world varies greatly. And of course, access to cessation or switching or, or alternative products is going to vary greatly by income level. Uh, and of the country as well. The political system makes a big difference. Obviously, if you had a, have a, a dictator, um, then what they say goes, you know, whether if it's a 
Democratic Republic. And then we look at the smoking prevalence. I'll, I put the smoking prevalence for the average for the whole population and then for the Indigenous people. And you can see for Costa Rica there, there's no data for Indigenous people. And they ratified the FCTC in 2008. Uh, and this is a common story, regardless of whether they have ratified or signed the Framework Convention, they don't uh, disaggregate their data for different groups. They just tick box and put in into the report that goes in, which you can all see. All right, so one of the things that's often said about Indigenous people, even among our tobacco harm reduction community, it's kind of like a... Um, smoking prevalence is disproportionately higher among marginalized groups, LGBT, um, homeless people, people with mental health conditions, indigenous people. Uh-uh, hold on, hang on a minute there. Actually, do we know that for sure? Um, that is not actually confirmed. Just because it's disproportionately higher for Māori in New Zealand, Australian Aboriginal people in Australia, the First Nations people in Canada, uh, the Inuit in Canada, you know, just because smoking is disproportionately higher among four or five Indigenous people in the world, I've just showed you how many there are. Uh, actually, we don't know that. I don't think that it's, it's, if you're going to say that, then pin it down to, we're talking about five countries colonized by the British. What about Latin America? We know nothing about what's happening there for indigenous people. Okay, so we actually identified 105 countries who have indigenous people using our definition. And we classified it, there are five categories of how smoking prevalence is being monitored. So I'll just go through each of those uh, one by one now. So suppression of data. Eight countries suppress data, reporting of data by ethnicity. So country uh, China and Myanmar, they have a forced assimilation policy. So you're, you, you can't have your own ethnicity. Uh, so from time to time, some countries will do that in their expansion um, mode. The, uh, some countries refuse to recognize the existence of indigenous people. And there are still some indigenous peoples who are at threat. Um, yep. Some have been killed off already around the world and some are still at threat. In Finland and Sweden, this is a very different issue. Uh, they they um, they don't report. I think I think Sweden does collect data by ethnicity sometimes, but they don't report it. And the supposed reason for doing that is to prevent the stigmatization of by ethnicity. So, for example, if one group are always or, or committing crime more than other groups and then it's reported in the paper and then that leads to everybody stereotyping them as criminals. So Finland and Sweden tend to not report by ethnicity. I think they do have some of the data. Um, so that's a problem. How, how are the indigenous peoples in these countries supposed to know what their smoking prevalence is if it's not collected? one or report it. So the next category was that there just is no data on smoking prevalence. Um, and that was 66 countries. Uh, yeah, many are low income and they, they clearly, they just lack the capacity to routinely collect data. Many of them still are signatories to the framework convention or have ratified it and fill in those reports, um, how accurate they are. Though, And those reports are used by uh, the Tobacco Free Initiative to, to create their Tobacco Atlas report. Um, and they're used by 
the World Health Organization to say this is how many people smoke or use tobacco in the world. I'm not sure that that you know I'm I'm not sure of the accuracy of the, of a lot of that data. Um, Nepal has 59 recognized indigenous peoples, but there are many countries in there with hundreds of indigenous peoples. There's not even a kind of like we have Māori. One we don't have how much each of the tribes in New Zealand uh, smokes, although we have had a report in the past that did that, and it is possible to do that from our census data and national data. But even, even saying, well, of all of the indigenous people grouped together in, in Nepal, how many, no, it's not there. In some countries, there was sporadic data reported by researchers. So some researchers has gone, oh, I think it would be really interesting to know what the smoking prevalence rate is among that tribe. Um, so in Russia and my colleagues in Russia and I, we did a systematic review of the research and that paper is published. And uh, in Russia, there's 47 recognized indigenous peoples. Um, there was research we found over a, a few decades so there's no way to figure out a pattern um, they focused on different tribal tribes in different areas of Russia they don't ask the same questions um, sometimes it was really really high for men and women and in other areas it, it they would report a lower rate there was no consistency and we couldn't we just can't say <laughs> so um, so some research is done, but again, it's just small studies here and there. Now, some, in 17 countries, the indigenous people are a substantial majority. Um, you could say, well, why did I include, say, Samoa, for instance? Um, but we looked, at, we looked at countries that had been colonized um, or heavily influenced by say America or Britain um, and but and this is the thing in some countries where they were colonized the colonizers didn't actually want to go there they don't actually want to live there they just want to suck all the resource out you know whether it's sugar cane or uh, use use that country and the peoples to grow something and you just have a small kind of colonial outpost. Um, now, you know, Taiwan is a very interesting one to read about because of its strategic position in in the world, um, in the in the sea. So th that was interesting. So there are seventeen countries where there is smoking prevalence reported. Um, and it's indicative because, you know, well, 94% or something of the population are Samoan. So, you know, pretty much that's the smoking rate going to be for them. Okay, so here's Samoa. 90% of the population are uh, of Samoa are Samoan. And um, in 2018, in the 18 to 64 average smoking prevalence rate was 32.3% for males and 13.9% for females. I suppose what I was very interested in, you know, you, you clearly have the influence of a, of a colonizing or um, helping nation. And these colonizing nations, you know, tobacco was at the forefront of that colonial push into a country. Alcohol and tobacco. These were primary uh, products they were um, that the colonizers could trade with. Plus they happened to have um, a good return rate, you know, like trade with this. Oh, and they like it and they're going to keep coming back. Um, yeah, and just fascinating how tobacco and alcohol particularly were used in the colonization of countries and in trading with uh, indigenous peoples and what they traded for. Um, now, just on that point, in tobacco control, 
most of the focus and of the framework convention on tobacco control was that it's the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry did this. The tobacco industry created that big machine that made mass mass manufactured cigarettes and spread it all around the world. And they did that with marketing and advertising and they hooked people in. And so the whole story within tobacco control is that this it was the tobacco industry. But actually those companies, those multinational huge tobacco companies, um, which are really overshadowed by say China tobacco, Japan tobacco, so um, state monopoly, uh, state owned tobacco companies, um, they are actually relatively new. If you start going back to 1500 and looking at, um, and we've just seen recently a report of research projects saying that tobacco dates back, human use of tobacco dates back over 12,000 years. So in my research for this report, I found 8,000 years and now there's research suggesting it's over 12,000 years. Well, I'm sorry, Philip Morris and British American Tobacco, they they haven't been along around that long. And so there's a very, very interesting story of how tobacco dispersed from tribe to tribe, from indigenous people to another indigenous people. And there's a fascinating uh, similarity between what say indigenous groups or tribes in deep in the Amazon who use tobacco. And then you find hey, they're doing the same thing way over here in another part of the world. We don't know, it's a long time ago, but there's clearly a pattern of dispersion and sharing of a of a item of trade, how to use it, way before tobacco companies came along. There'll be another kind of radical <laughs> thing that tobacco control won't like me putting out there, I suppose. Now, there are only five out of 105 countries have regular government funded monitoring of smoking prevalence collected by ethnicity. Only five, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, Canada, and Fiji. Uh, Fiji's had a lot of, you know, sibling support from Australia and New Zealand you know, foreign aid, <laughs> um, they come under kind of under the wing of Australia a lot and which many of the Pacific Islands do. So it's kind of like, do as we say, we're, we're, gonna, we're here to help you. We're here to help you. Um, in other words, here's the playbook, sing our song, that's how it goes. And that's these regions. So the World Health Organization, um, the Framework Convention Tobacco Control have regional, um, well, they work through the World Health Organization regional offices. So only five countries had stats and the inset box was what I could find for Australia. Daily smoking rates um, for 18 years and over 46% for 2019, 46% of males smoke, 41% of females. This is Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander people in, in Australia. But that smoking prevalence is averaged over more than 500 tribes. And there's actually quite a big difference between remote areas of Australia, tribes in remote areas in Northern Territory, right over in the top of Western Australia, and those that live um, closer to the um, city centres. Um, I'm going to enjoy reading all this chat about, you know, Philippines imported a few Cuban. Yep, and that's right. I mean, there was a lot of trade across before just British American Tobacco or RJ Reynolds or any of those American companies and, and British companies established. So the FCTC is failing Indigenous peoples in a number of ways. Um, the first one is that it's in there that the countries that are signed up, they should be collecting data and they need to be disaggregating that for the groups. Um, what they should be doing should be having an equitably beneficial effect for all groups within the country. 
but that clearly is not happening. So smoking prevalence is declining generally across, you know, particularly high income countries, but um, the decline is not occurring equitably uh, or at all among some indigenous peoples. And then I talked about this process of just making, making us invisible, not collecting data or reporting data on indigenous people, not saying the word, um, it just, doesn't come up. And you could say the same for other marginalized groups, um, but it's a particular problem for, you know, for us. Now, in New Zealand, what I always argued was that the focus needed to be reducing the inequity between the smoking prevalence among Māori and non-Māori. That should be the first thing, like bring bring the smoking prevalence rates into alignment, not by increasing the smoking in one group, but if, if there is a group, Aboriginal people in Australia, their smoking prevalence rate, can I go back to that? You have 40, 46% for males, 41% for females, and how many, what, what are they claiming in Australia for daily smoking prevalence? They're like claiming 12% across the country. Like, excuse me, what's going on? There's like a 30 something percent, 34% difference. What should be happening is bring that down first and foremost, bring it down. Whatever you do, all of the resource should be on bringing that down. Then you, then you go forward and make sure that your policies have equitable effects for the different groups in society. Um, the, for indigenous people and for varied cultural groups where you have you know, massive cultural differences, um, there needs to be culturally appropriate interventions and you know, smoking cessation programs or switching programs. But the FCTC sort of says that you know, it says you should tailor, you know, to the country and you should, you know, and, and there in my notes, I've got, you know, they they say they're deeply concerned about the high levels of smoking and other forms of tobacco consumption among indigenous people. But this, the countries aren't doing anything about reducing that inequity. Even in New Zealand, the policy, it's always because we have our own treaty. So it's always said, oh yeah, Māori are a priority. We must reduce smoking among Māori. But you know, you take our smoke-free 2025 policy and um, to, to reach 5% by 2025, Māori aren't going to get there. What are they doing which is extra or reparative to, to reduce that? No. And the, the other thing that happens, of course, is that the unintended negative effects of tobacco control, they uh, often experience disproportionately more by Indigenous peoples and people who are on low income. Um, now, I think I'm going to run out of time. Um, to be consistent, now, all of the treaties, you, you can't have one treaty over here and another one over there that actually one undermines the other. The United Nations Treaty should be um, working together, not undermining each other. For the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control to be consistent with the UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, the framework should only focus on that um, mass manufactured, commercial mass manufactured tobacco products, not traditional. Traditional ways or traditional uses of tobacco should be exempt from the framework focus. Otherwise, it's a colonizing tool. It's a way of um, destroying and eliminating traditional ways of life and culture and songs and dances around tobacco and uses of tobacco that wasn't smoking, that was for healing or other uses. That's another study. Um, the signatories that and the countries that ratified the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control 
need to respect the rights of Indigenous people. They, there needs to be regular monitoring, disaggregation of the data by ethnic group, sex as well. It's not always, you know, very, very different rates of tobacco use by men, between men and women, uh, and also by age and living condition, urban versus rural and remote. Harm reduction programs, like reducing the harm, that's what the focus should be on, um, need to be determined, designed by, and run by and for Indigenous peoples. And you can say the same for other minority groups. They need to be culturally appropriate. They need, otherwise they're not necessarily going to be effective. Um, and, and you must look at the, um, inequitable cost of the unintended negative effects, the, um, the higher extraction of tobacco taxes from particular groups, Indigenous people, and fines, and criminalising people, and then incarcerating them. So that's a big problem for us as well. Okay. Um, any, Nancy, do you want to come back? And have I got some I'm here. I'm here. I've just got to figure out how to turn my camera on. Hi. Hi there. I have two questions for you, believe it Great. or not. Great. Okay. First question, it was from Chaga. She mentioned this earlier, and I wonder if you can explain it. Why do you think that the WHO and the UN don't make it very clear that the treaty is actually a UN treaty? Uh, I, th I think that um, maybe the World Health Organization, you know, 20 years ago, had more... Mm, more, you know, the <laughs> United Nations obviously has a lot, but this was the first health, the first mm -hmm. health treaty, the first treaty to address a health issue. Um, they were sitting within the World Health Organization, the Tobacco Free Initiative uh, that Derek Yak was part of was, was a World Health Organization program. It, you know, so lots of uh, interconnection and interdependencies there, I think. Okay, makes sense. Second question. Um, a lot of indigenous communities and cultures use tobacco as a ritual. Do you think that that may have something to do with the way it's not reported? Um, well, indigenous peoples, and I have another whole study, which I mm. just need to get written up, but it's a really huge area if you look at the history of indigenous people's use of tobacco. So there were many, many uses, um, even, even for food. Um, agriculture, um, and there are many products and many, many uses. So it was used in healing ways. It had, mm -hmm. it had uses for spiritual um, uses. So yes, it was used in rituals, spiritual or cultural rituals, um, for cleansing, for warding off evil, uh, for protecting people from viruses um you know it was used in lots of different ways and by different people within the tribe as well yeah no i know that because i have a friend who's first nations and she used to explain to me about you know her grandmother would make concoctions and that, that there was ritual around the use of tobacco and i always wondered you know when you think about these i hate to say it, establishment tobacco control treaties and things like that they don't take that into consideration they just you know, oh, it's bad, just like you were saying. Yeah, this, this is one of the reasons why there have been very few Indigenous people involved in tobacco control. So it used to be that all of the Native Americans were like, uh, no, we, we do not agree with you. We do not agree with the FCTC because you're out to eliminate tobacco and um, we have and, and tobacco is a sacred plant to us and we use it in particular particular ways. So yeah. you have to change your, you know, what you're doing and mm -hmm. the framework wouldn't do it. The, you know, it's been dominated by white Western uh, Europeans, Americans and, and British people, they wouldn't do it. So very, you know, I've been going to world conferences since 1993 
and hardly ever see any indigenous people. The one in Chicago I did, but this was a real sticking point. So even today, a lot of the indigenous people who are involved in tobacco control, the Framework Convention or the SRNT, the Society for Research Nicotine and Tobacco, mm -hmm. they are, um, they have to agree to, to, they sign up, they sign up to that white Western colonizing agenda and they push it and they, yeah, they're hurting their own people. Either they don't know, um, they're junior like I was, um, uh, and, you know, there have been times, there were three centers of research focused on indigenous smoking, one in Canada, one in Australia, my one in Auckland, and we all lasted around about the same period of time. And then suddenly, just strangely, we all got shut down at around the same time. Very weird funding issues. Um, yeah. And but it, it, it's as soon as you start saying indigenous or treaty or no, actually, we don't want no, no, our people actually don't agree with tax. No, no, this is actually harming our people. As soon as you do that, you're out. And um, so many, uh, not many people in indigenous in tobacco control worldwide and the few that have been in there don't last. Um, and the ones that are in there now, if they're accepted, it's because they, they're they doing the job. You all had your words in your cultures um, for, for the indigenous people who were recruited into the wars against their own, I'm sure. Okay, quite last question. Well, second to last question I have for you. We've got a little extra time. Do you think that the former colonial powers that, you know, colonized these countries and perhaps created issues, should it help to address the issues of the indigenous peoples? Uh, sort of, no, it's a kind of like harm reduction, you know, where mm. people who use tobacco say nothing about us without us. Right. So there are very similar things, you know, I would say, be like, be like indigenous and say, no, we want to do it for ourselves. You can help, but basically you need to, you know, they need to hand over the resource um, yeah. and they need to develop your capacity, you know, like, Chugga's got her master's and she works with us as a researcher. And, you know, you guys need to develop your own capacity to do your own research. That's what indigenous people want to do. We want to do our own research. We don't want a white yeah. professor from the UK coming here and telling us what to do, but that's exactly what's happened. And, sure. and, and they won't ever let us, um, you know, all we get are like we said, we have a saying like we're sick of pilots, you know, when do we get the plane? Mm -hmm. So we'll get a little yeah. bit of funding to run a pilot here and a pilot there. It doesn't matter how many times we prove that our program we, we designed is way more effective with our own people if we designed it and we run it and we work with our own people. Yeah. We never get to roll it out. I mean, I actually have got to roll out some programs, but then they just took it away and gave it to a white woman to run. And she, yeah. she crashed it. She crashed the plane, you know? And then, yeah. of course, that feeds that stereotype. Oh, well, you know, it always fails. Well, you know, the thing is, it's, it's very disempowering to develop something and then have somebody hijack it from you when they have absolutely no understanding of where that program came from, why it was, you know, developed. It's colonization again. Like, you know, yeah. it, it, it's colonization. And it's, it's so insidious that, you know, trying to buck that is just like, it's an, it's an ongoing battle. Last question for you. If you had the opportunity to say something to the delegates of the COP9, what would you say? Resign. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just stop, you know. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's a junket. Um, I put my hand up many years. I was like, you need someone to go to the FCTC, to the COP? I'll go, I'll go. Um, some years it was like, uh, who wants to go to the COP, you know, around the Ministry of Health and that. Um, it was some, a lot of the time it was a chore 
and and then they'd look around like oh who should we send to the cop um oh you know and it was also a way of giving a bit of a um what what's it called when you get something a not like a, a treat at a girl like a treat yeah, yeah. you I know, know like saying. motivation you know, you, um yeah i know what you're a perk a perk yeah. You know, so you want to, you know, whoever's in charge wants to hand out some perks to a particular favoured worker at the time or someone who's an up and coming or on the rise, you know, and it'd be like, oh, why don't you go to the COP for New Zealand this year? You can be our delegate. Um, and then, you know, for many years, they just hired the same consultant and he went and did it, an yep. ex-policy analyst for the ministry. I kept mm -hmm. putting my hand up. Oh, can I go? Can I go? I never got to actually go to the COP. Um, but I did see that it was seen as a chore. And I do think it's a bit of an insult to put a very junior person representing New Zealand. Why couldn't it have been Ashley Bloomfield? I know our Director General for Health, um, I know he's very busy, but he actually, and I'll talk a bit about the history some more tomorrow, um, he was, he went and did a stint at the World Health Organization working on the Framework Convention. Um, and I think it would carry a lot more weight if, mm -hmm. if he actually presented New Zealand's position. Um, and sometimes, I um, don't recall if any politicians went, but, you know, sometimes it's a bit of a junket for them as well to get to go to Geneva. At the moment, of course, it's all online. So, so no sure. perks and travel and, and Switzerland <laughs> holidays. And chocolate and things like that. <laughs> Thanks, Mona. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll see you Thank tomorrow. you for letting me be part of your scope. Thank um, you for joining us. You guys. It's a pleasure. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Yeah. 10 o'clock, okay. same time. Same time, same channel. Well, different channel, but yes. Yeah. Thanks, Marawa. Okay. Bye. Bye.